Welcome to the Lower Columbia chapter of the Ice Age Floods Institute. Thank you so much for coming today. Tonight we have Rick Thompson giving a presentation on the Lake Missoula floods in Northwest Oregon and Southwest Washington. So I will turn this over to Rick. So if you will do a screen share. The Lake Missoula floods in Northwest Oregon and Southwest Washington by me, Rick Thompson. To talk about Ice Age floods, we need to first talk about the Ice Age and what caused the flood was actually uh, part of the ice age, but it wasn't. It wasn't the. It wasn't the ice sheet itself that was causing the backup. It was actually an ice lobe. So what we're seeing here is the, a simplified version of the ice cap that was. Uh, we had two in Canada basically, and this would be the the westernmost one. An ice lobe is pushed out from the ice, uh, ice sheet itself by the weight of the snow and ice building up in the middle of the ice sheet. So it actually pushes out. Uh, and, and that's what we have as ice lobes. There are quite a few ice lobes. Ice lobes are fingers of ice pushed out of the ice caps. They move through internal pressure of the ice in the ice cap. So the more ice builds up in the middle, the more these can push out. So they're actually not getting the snow and ice themselves so much as they're being pushed from the center of the ice cap. They can move uphill and around obstacles. So here's the two uh, ice sheets that covered uh, Canada the Cordilleran on the west coast and the Laurentide in the center. And you'll see the fingers down below. Let me see, can you see my mouse here? Where these arrows are, yes. are fingers of ice that are being pushed out. They're not glaciers because they're actually being pushed by the, the weight in the ice cap itself. And right there is the one that we're concerned about. It's called the Purcell ice lobe goes between two mountain ranges in the panhandle of Idaho in an area we call the Purcell Trench. So here's the setting for the Ice Age floods. There's the Cordillera ice sheet. Right there is the ice dam. That is that ice lobe that was pushed between the mountain ranges and it actually was being pushed uphill about 500 feet. Right there is Glacial Lake Missoula. Now that looks rather strange for a lake because it wasn't really a lake. It was merely the valleys of the Northern Rockies being filled up with water as the ice sheets begin to melt. But when that ice dam broke, it roared across Eastern Washington, creating the channeled scablands. It's collected part halfway down at Wallula Gap, which was like a a funnel that was too small for the water coming in, so it actually backfilled and created a huge 3,000 square mile lake that we call Lake Lewis. But it did finally get through the uh, Wallula Gap, got down to the Columbia River Gorge, and again, it was too small for the water coming in, so it backed up and created what we call Lake Condon. Then it finally got through the gorge, got up to Kalama Gap, and another place, it was too narrow, so it backfilled the Willamette Valley, forming what we call Lake Allison. Now, there's three shapes of valleys, and two of these were recognized a, a long time ago. A regular river valley, it's a V-shape and has the river in the bottom, so as it worked its way down, it eroded a V-shaped valley. A U-shaped valley is created by glaciers. As the glacier slides down and pushes down through the ridge, or through the actually valley that it's in, it rounds it off, so we have a U-shaped valley. But very fast moving water creates flood channels, which are a box-shaped channel. Uh, in some cases, they're called coulees. In other cases, they're just called uh, flood channels. 
and the channeled scab lands in Washington have just what we just saw. We have the box-shaped valley. Now this one does taper a little bit, but basically it has the, the straight sides and fairly flat bottom. This is Palouse Falls. If you haven't been there, it's worth the trip. This is Dry Falls, which for two weeks was the largest waterfall in the world, five times the size of Niagara. It's 400 feet from the lip to the uh, plunge pool down below, and the water itself was 300 feet above the lip. So this was a major, major waterfall for, like I say, about two weeks. This is Moses Cooley. This is to the west of uh, Dry Falls and Grand Cooley. And it is 44 miles long, 1.1 mile wide, 600 feet deep. And it's got very straight sides and a very flat bottom and no water. There, there's a little creek and a lake at the northern end, but there's basically no water in this dry stream bed because it wasn't a regular stream. It was a massive, very fast moving flood that tore away all this rock. We're going to talk about, well, they used to be called glacial erratics. These are now, and there certainly are glacial erratics. If you go up to uh, the Puget Sound area, every rock you see will be a glacial erratic because it was brought in by glaciers. An erratic is a boulder that doesn't have a local source, so it has to be brought in somehow. We did not have glaciers in Western Oregon, so ours are ice-rafted boulders, or I like to call them iceberg erratics. They're still erratics, they don't have a local source, but they were brought here in icebergs. This is the largest one that we know of. This is 90 tons of a metamorphic mudstone called argillite. They say this is the largest piece of argillite outside of Canada. Guess where it's from? Canada. Now it's got very sharp edges and it's very brittle. So we know this did not come in a normal flood. It would have been rolled and rounded off, but it's so brittle, it never would have made the trip. So we know that where it was found 300 feet above the, uh, 300 feet in elevation was where an iceberg got grounded and as it melted it set the rock down at 300 feet. This is the second largest one that we know of. This is actually at uh, Mount Hood Community College and uh, Mount Hood? No, no Clackamas <laughs> Community College. <laughs> that, right, it was found where where I-205 and I-5 meet, and they were gonna destroy it so they could get it out of their way, but one of the engineers said, no, that, that's a special rock, let's save it. So they took it to uh, Hackamas Community College. This is the third largest that we know of. This is down west of Salem. So this rock, which is granite, uh, was carried in ice all the way down to west of Salem in the uh, uh, Yamhill Valley. These are in Tualatin at the Heritage Center. Now, none of them were found there. They were actually found in other places and moved. The large one on the upper right is 10 tons of granite. It was found over by Gaston. And again, they were going to destroy it to get rid of, get it out of the farmer's field but they decided to donate it to the Tualatin Heritage Center, where it is now. The one left of that is another one that was found over in that same area, and it is a feldspar, a two and a half ton rock. And the other ones down below are just smaller ones that have been found around the area. Here's one in the Tualatin Library. This was uh, obviously a small one and was found in the Tualatin area. This is at the Tualatin Commons. This is another piece of argillite, like that first one, and you'll see the sign for it. It's at the north end of the little lake there if you want to go uh, look at this. These are also at Tualatin Commons. These are granite and quartz and these are down at the south end of the lake. 
Now the new or fairly new uh, Tualatin, uh, uh, Tualatin River Ice Age, uh, the, the Greenway Trail, my wife's helping me here. <laughs> the, the trail was dedicated a few years ago. It is, has a whole section called A Walk Through Time and it has the story of the Ice Age floods. So the three uh, main pictures are glacial erratics that have been put there. The uh, little ob obelisk, or whatever you'd call these, displays, talk about the ice, a, the ice rafted boulders and how to recognize them. So here's one of the displays on there that shows you where these rocks are and what they are. We have diorite, we have gneiss, we have quartz diorite, hornfels, and granite with pegmatite. So if you want to see what these rocks actually look like, they're on the Tualatin River Greenway Trail, right? You start it right behind the library. This is at OMSI. These were actually found, this was found in uh, McMinnville and was brought to OMSI and they, they put up this sign uh, to talk about it. This one's in Northeast Portland, right off Gleason Street. These are the most recent ones we've found in this area. This is over in Gresham. We are just driving along and I said, wait a minute, look at that rock. <laughs> so the one on the right is andesite from the, uh, the Cascade Mountains, but the one on the left is granite and it is from the Northern Rockies. This is in a, what they call a bioswale in Camus, and you can see marks on it where it has actually been cut. They used, uh, they drilled holes and then pounded pegs in the holes to split the rock to make uh, tombstones and cornerstones and various different things that you would make out of large rocks. This is at the Washington State University in Vancouver, this was found in a field just to the east of the university. And uh, again, it was donated. We don't have a sign there talking about it. We need to do that. So it is a large granite uh, erratic on the campus there. These are down just northwest of Salem. And the top one's in an area called Basket Slough. The one on the right is on 99 and it is or is it Wallace Road might be on Wallace Road it's a a monument to the man who built the first brick house west of the Mississippi now these the one on the left is at Rex Hill winery this was found at about 400 feet on in one of their vineyards and brought to the tasting room so if you go to the tasting room you'll see this right behind where you park the one on the right is at the Kaiser, uh, it's not a hospital, but the Kaiser Medical Center in Hillsboro. It was found as they were doing the construction and they decided to put it on display and give it a couple beavers for uh, uh, companionship, I guess. Now this is down at Salem. On the right, right there is a glacial erratic was found just south of Salem and brought to the Willamette University right across the street from the Capitol building. The most famous of our iceberg erratics, the Willamette meteorite. This is a, a replica of it down at Eugene at the university there. Why is it an iceberg erratic? Well, there was no crater where it was found, whoops. No crater where it was found, and there were other erratic rocks found near it. So it was probably, it was a, a it, it's named the Willamette Meteorite. It probably landed on the Purcell Ice Lobe near Canada-US border, and then was transported to Oregon in an iceberg during the largest Lake Missoula flood, what I call the Giga Flood. Here is what it looks like now because it is now in New York City. It's on display at the Hayden Planetarium as part of the Natural History Museum. And uh, you have to go there if you want to see it because it's not coming back. But we do have a replica. 
This is a one-fifth scale uh, computer-generated replica in Fieldsbridge Park in West Lynn. It's uh, extremely accurate uh, for uh, what it actually looks like. Uh, it wasn't like a filling a bathtub and then draining it out. It was actually a, a gray slurry of rock and mud resembling the concrete coming out of a cement truck at freeway speeds. Now, what it is, it's a mud flow off of uh, Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines. And it's a slurry of rock and, and melted ice. Seventy percent rock, thirty percent water. It's what some geologists call a liquid solid, because as soon as it quits moving, it will turn to a a like a sandstone type rock. What keeps it flowing is the same principle as in liquefaction in an earthquake. So uh, as long as it keeps moving, it'll keep flowing. As soon as it stops, it sets up like concrete. This is from a an earthquake in Pakistan. And this one has huge rocks like the one you see on the left. And again, very little water, but uh, just a massive rock flow. Um, and up again, up to 70% rock and 30% and water. Now, how do we know that the Lake Missoula flood was like that? This is, is a map of the Columbia River Gorge. You can see the gorge going right through the middle. Above and below, I've put pictures of gravel deposits that we have found from the Lake Missoula floods. So uh, Tumwater Bar, 730 feet above sea level. The Four Mile Bar, 720 feet above sea level. All of these, all of these are deposits of gravel on both sides up to a mile uh, across from each other on e either side of the gorge, which means that the gravel had to be that high all the way across as it came down through the Columbia River Gorge. So as the flood did come down, the first thing it did, it hit Beacon Rock and scoured off the edges. Beacon Rock, as far as we can tell, used to be a volcano. Now all that we have is the center of the volcano uh, because the, the sides were sheared off by that slurry of rock and mud and ice. Next thing it did was hit Crown Point. It created a 600 foot cliff and leveled off the top so we could put a restroom there. Then it came into the Willamette Valley. This is Lake Allison, named for a, a geologist that walked all over the Willamette Valley about 100 years ago, making note of where he found the glacial evidences. And he found uh, 200, at least 250 places where there were uh, glacial erratics found. Now, when water comes through a narrow, uh, confine and then spreads out, it forms a delta. So we've got the uh, Mississippi Delta, the Nile Delta, you've, you've heard of it, anywhere that it can happen. We have the Portland Delta. And here's what the Portland Delta looks like when the gravel bars are highlighted. The red is where we have gravel that was deposited up to 300 feet high and Alameda Ridge down in Portland is 11 miles long. That's all gravel that was brought in by these floods. Now, what do I mean by gravel? Now, normally gravel goes up to about eight inches, but 
this gravel is a little bit bigger. It's not erratics. It, these are just flood rocks, which means they're mainly basalt from the Columbia River Gorge or andesite from the Cascade Mountains. And here's a, a few examples of them. Here's the largest ones I've found. These are about 120 tons. And these are about 200 feet above the present day Columbia River. So you wonder what kind of force could have moved those and lifted them 200 feet. Well, it was a massive flood. This is just one neighborhood in Northeast Portland. If you've got these things in your yard, you kind of have to do some with, something with them. Some people are more creative than others. And then sometimes they can actually get in the way and, and be kind of a challenge as with this. I uh, had to go to work, so I didn't get to see what they did to, to get, the, get the trailer off of the glacial erratic, but they had to do, or the flood rock. These weren't erratics, these were just flood rocks. So the backup, when the water got all the way around to the Kalama and Gobel area, Again, it was too narrow for the water to get through. It's also believed that a lot of those icebergs that became, that were part of the original ice dam, jammed up like uh, a, a log jam, only with ice. Kind of like when the waitress goes to pour the water out of the pitcher and the, the ice jams up and won't let it out. Well, that's kind of what we think happened up at Kalama. And that caused it to uh, back up and fill the Willamette Valley. So this is uh, the, the entire Willamette da Valley down to Eugene. It was 400 feet in the Portland area. And then down at Eugene, it was only uh, a few inches to uh, up to 100 feet. So here's the water coming in to the uh, western valleys of Oregon. The, uh, the size of the arrow indicates the amount of water and the volume of water as it was coming in. So the top part is where it filled up the Tualatin Valley and then found places to flow into the Yamhill Valley on the left and the Willamette Valley in the middle. So here's the actual uh, area that where we are and what we're talking about came across Portland tore through Lake Oswego, tore through uh, the Willamette Falls area. So here's the Carver Gap. This is where it flowed into the Clackamas River Valley. And there's the Carver Gap. It's got sharp edges and was enlarged with the water going both in and out. So it went in about to Estacada and then flowed back out at the end of the flood. Here's Lake Oswego on the west side. This, we may have had a, a creek or something there first, but the floods found it as a, a low area that it could roar through into the Tualatin Valley. So it actually gouged out actually two channels, one's dry and then the other one has the lake in it. Here we are flying uh, over, um, we're looking northeast, and here's the flow of the water from the uh, Portland area into the, the Tualatin Valley area. And again, we have a delta. This is where it dumped all the rocks that it had just picked up and gouged out of Lake Oswego and dumped it to the, into the Durham area where the Bridgeport Shopping Center is now. So for 100 years, they've been harvesting rocks there now they've filled it in and are harvesting money. This is the Oregon City Gap. This is where it flowed down into the Willamette Valley. And then at the end of the flood, it flowed back out. On both sides of the Oregon City Gap, there are scab lands. These are just like the scab lands up in Washington where the rocks were moved and were removed and all the soil was removed. There was actually two layers of lava taken off of the Camasia Nature Preserve and the Kanima Wild Area. So this is taken in uh, March and April when the camas flower is blooming. 
The camas only needs about an inch of soil, which is all that it has there. This is what it looks like the rest of the year because there's so little soil. Here's the, the Tualatin area, and you'll see there's channels just between Tualatin and Sherwood. The water came through Lake Oswego, filled the Tualatin Valley, and then flowed back down between uh, Tualatin and Sherwood. In Tualatin, <laughs> this guy isn't there, isn't alive today, but inside the library, we have the skeleton of a mastodon that was found in one of these channels. We also have in the library some paintings by Stevo Minsky of the uh, Willamette meteorite arriving from space, then arriving uh, in the iceberg. This is a, in the uh, Tualatin Library, this is a part of a mammoth that was found over in, uh, next to Sherwood in the uh, Saipol Swamp area. To my knowledge, the rest of the mammoth is still there. It's never been excavated. These are also in the library. This is part of the, on the left there, that is the uh, sacrum of a ground sloth. These were over nine feet tall. And uh, I don't know if they were slow moving like modern sloths, but they were uh, uh, ground, not, not tree dwellers. And then the other parts are parts of the mastodon and, and uh, Actually, the, the one on the left, the pointed one, that is the uh, toe bone of a ground sloth. It's the, the center part that had the, the, uh, 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 the, the shell of the claw on uh, uh, the outside. This is the Tualatin River Greenway Trail. The blue in the middle represents the water of the Ice Age floods. This is over in uh, West Lynn, and this is where that the meteorite is. So here's, there's three of these uh, interpretive areas. This one is telling the, the story of the meteorite and, and how it was discovered and that sort of thing. And that replica I showed you is at this park. Now the Tualatin Commons shows that Tualatin has been thinking about it being an Ice Age destiny for, for many years. And this, uh, it, it's a man-made lake with a park-like setting around it. And the, the railing here represents water. That's why it's in the, the wavy pattern. It also has a, a fountain, drinking fountains representing the icebergs that floated the rocks in. This is Ibac Park. This is also in Tualatin. We've got a representative of the meteorite, and then behind it, we have a representative of the skeleton of the uh, mastodon. So it's all uh, things that kids can play on and learn about these floods. They actually have a water feature where you can create your own little flood, and they have erratics mounted in the, uh, the water feature. From space, we can see those uh, the uh, flood channels that go between Tualatin and Sherwood. On the left here, we have Sherwood. Right down from upper left to bottom right is one of the major channels we call the Tonkin channels because there was a little town uh, named Tonkin there at one time. So these are called the, the Tonkin flood channels and this is the Tonkin natural area. Tonkin geologic area. These are quarries. Since all the soil was removed, uh, the rock was very easy to just back your truck up to and, and fill it with rock. Right there is Coffee Lake, which is a coke lake created by a vortex in the flood as two channels came together uh, in a, a V down a little bit lower than the picture here, and then created an underwater tornado. Uh, geologists call it a kulk, but it's, it's like a tornado and it can pick up bedrock and cast it aside the way a tornado can take up houses and cars and throw them aside. 
This is that largest channel. Here we are looking north, and I like to leave the trestle in there so that you can see how this is a, a flood channel with steep sides and a flat bottom. This is that same channel down at the bottom, and it shows Coffee Lake. Again, very flat. The water is, is not very shallow at all. I'm not very deep at all. They call it Coffee Lake because I guess the water looks sort of like coffee, so probably don't want to drink it. But it is a cold lake created by these floods. Now here's the water coming in, and uh, you can see the, the volume, and it was very massive. It probably only took uh, 24 hours or, or so for it to actually fill the valleys once it got here. Here it is filling the uh, Tualatin area and the, the, uh, the channels between Tualatin and, and uh, Sherwood. And there's Tualatin, which is where we normally have our meetings. And here is the water going back out. Now you may have noticed that, that the arrows are different sizes because what, where a lot of it came in through Lake Oswego, more of it went out through uh, Oregon City. And there's Tualatin again. And there's the, the whole Tualatin area. Here it is. This is how it drained out through Portland. This is Lake Oswego on the left and Oregon City at the bottom and a Carver Gap with Clackamas River on the right. It came through, it made these uh, eddies in various places that we can still see. Uh, the one up at the top is the Portland Bluffs where the University of Portland is and where the, the first airport was. So then it roared out through Portland out the Columbia River, out through the Astoria Channel, and then it, we found these deposits all the way down to Cape Mendocino in Northern California. So we know that a lot of the, the gravel that was brought was continued to be carried out into the ocean and then carried down along Northern California. Now in Tualatin, we're working on several Ice Age themed uh, programs. This is the, uh, what is it called? The, I'm sorry. Um, yes, it's, there it is right in front of me. This is the Ice Age Tonkin Trail, about 21 miles from Wilsonville all the way up to Tigard. It's not totally open yet. They still have to get some of the right-of-ways but it'll be a, a very nice walking and uh, bike trail when it's built. The Ice Age Floods National Geologic Trail goes all the way from Missoula to the Pacific Ocean at Astoria. And Tualatin was the first recognized spot on the trail. What it will be is a, a hub and a portal where people can find out about the trail. So this, this won't be, they're not gonna buy any land for this trail. It'll be using regular roads or rivers, or you can fly over it, you can walk it, you can ride a horse, you can kayak, you can canoe, any way that you can travel, you can travel part of the Ice Age Floods National Geologic Trail. This is the uh, Tualatin Greenway Trail, which is a part where you can walk or, or bike or jog in this case. And here it is looking to the east. Here's the end of the Ice Age floods, right? They are marked in stone. So as you, as you walk along, it's uh, so many years per step that you take. And of course, we've got the megafauna. So here's where a mastodon walked across the trail. And here's where a giant sloth walked across. They've got very unusual footprints because they walked on the side of their feet. So they're very, they don't look like a regular footprint, but they're definitely recognizable for what they are. There's where the human and the megafauna met when the humans finally came into the area. 
And here they are for the uh, Tuolity Indians, or Atfaladi Indians that we, we translate into Tuolity. Uh, they, they showed up just at that time. This is some of the signs on the Greenway Trail. It's very informative. You can probably find out more from this trail than you'll find almost anywhere else. We've got replicas of some of the megafauna. So we've got a giant uh, bison on the left. We've got the jawbone of a mastodon on the right. Then we've got the saber-toothed salmon. This salmon, and this is life size here, it was about a 12 foot tall long <laughs> salmon, and it actually had saber type teeth. So I wouldn't want to go swimming with them. This is uh, part, go, walking along the trail, another part of the trail. I believe this is the Yvonne Addington Overlook. So, so the people can actually, the Tualatin River is right there, so they get to have a good view. And there's a, a dedication plaque in the center of that to uh, our friend Yvonne Addington that has done a lot to promote this. So here we are at a close-up of the Yvonne Addington Overlook. Now, if you want to know more about this, we have a, a real nice brochure that is available through the Ice Age Floods Institute. In fact, uh, this is the front, this is the back. They have a collection of 11 of these now from the different chapters. So you can find out the, the story of the whole area. This is the inside of, of our brochure. And we have five major things that you can see in this uh, Northern uh, Oregon area. So we've got the Tualatin area, whoops. <laughs> Tualatin area. Then we've got the, the uh, meteorite, and oh, this is Fields Bridge Park, so we have the meteorite there. Then we have uh, Willamette Falls, which is the uh, second largest waterfall in the United States by volume, and it was created by these floods. Then we've got the iceberg erratic. Then we've got the museum down at Eugene, where we have the replica of the uh, meteorite and erratics and a whole uh, display on the Ice Age floods. So for more detailed information, contact the Ice Age Floods Institute. They've got a very nice website with lots of information. Or you can contact my website, the, uh, the largest of the mega floods I call the Giga Flood. So, my website is www.gigaflood.com. One thing you'll find there is drive guides. Every year, except this year, we do a, a field trip and we write up the drive guide as if you were going to take it yourself. So you can take it yourself. It tells you where to look, uh, what you'll see, where to park, um, how far you have to walk at each place, uh, the, everything you need to know to do a, a field trip in the Ice Age Floods area. We also have a DVD of photos that uh, we took on an uh, overview of the channeled scab lands in eastern Washington. And we have the book Giga Flood. This has over 20 years of research in this area. Uh, so anything you want to know about the Ice Age floods in this area, the, the book is, is a very good resource. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much, Rick. So we will open it now uh, for questions. So uh, if you have a question, uh, why don't you raise your hand and uh, then we can unmute and get your questions. Does anyone have a question? Charlie. It is not unmuting you, Charlie. I don't know why. He can press his um, uh, space yeah. bar. How about that? Okay. Unmuted. I, I, okay. I wanted to ask, we, we have a house down where the Puget Island Ferry goes from Highway 30 
across to Puget Island, and that's just to the west of Kalama. And we were wondering if there are specific areas in this portion of the Columbia River, basically 30 miles east of Astoria, where we might search for erratic or more uh, of the flood signs. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I lost my picture. But I haven't done a lot of research in that area. The water was losing it, a lot of its energy. Uh, so um, I, I don't know what you might see down there. Um, okay. It definitely went through, but it was uh, only about 100 feet high or thereabouts. It widened the channel to almost 30 miles in places. Uh, but as far as what it actually left, I couldn't tell you. So, um. Well, I, I invite you to come down and, and stay here and research all of the valleys across Kath Lamed and up as well. Feel free to contact me anytime. Okay, that would be great. So are you a member? First meeting, yes. Oh, okay. Well, then uh, we'll have your address or at least an email for you. So. Uh, I'll see. Uh, that would be great. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Marilyn Karsted. I'm Mike's sister in Fresno, California. Hmm. Um, hi there. Uh, I am lost. What is this? <laughs> well, okay, maybe. oh, okay. I'm just Okay, so you you have a question? I just want to say Mike invited me to the to the uh, meeting. I just want to say I didn't know rocks could be so interesting. <laughs> they are very fascinating, and we don't have a lot of different kinds of rocks here, but the ones we do all tell a story. Uh, of course, mainly we have volcanic, so we've got the two basalt and andesite, and then we have. Uh, seafloor uplift, which is sandstone, um, and we find a lot of that between here and the coast. And But uh, then we have the erratics, and there's, there's probably eight or ten different kinds of erratics, oh there we are, uh, that, that come in, uh, that have been brought in. So we've got uh, mudstone, we've got shale, uh, uh, granite, uh, granite iorite, um, um, Jasper and agate, petrified wood. Uh, we have a lot of rocks that that didn't start here, but are here now. Well, well, thank you very much for a very interesting meeting. I enjoyed it. Well, thank you. Hope to uh, see or hear from you again. Anyone else? Either I either answered all your questions or I no. left. It. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Good to see okay, you again. This, this is Brian Hill. How how deep was the water at, at when the uh, lake was in Portland? How deep was the water in let's say downtown Portland? It was right about four hundred feet. That's not the elevation sea level. That's the de actual depth of the water. Right. Well, Portland is only 30 to 40 feet above sea level. Okay. So, so the, I guess you could say the water would have been 360 feet or thereabouts okay. right above Portland. And then over the river where it's, it, the river is essentially sea level. So it yep. was 400 feet uh, right there on the Willamette and the Columbia. Okay. Thank you. And I'm on the Alameda Ridge, so I'm on uh, 200 feet of gravel that was laid down um, by the floods. So right, it's definitely yeah. higher than that. Um, oh, and I, I found a granite boulder in my yard recently. So I was like, I'm like, I looked at that and I was like, look at you, you don't belong here. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, send me a picture of it. That would be great. Yes, we are, we're finding them all the time. 
And like you say, that whole gravel bar, 11 miles long, uh, is made out of uh, rocks, not all from Montana, but uh, rocks it, that it picked up along the way. Yeah, and, yeah. And I, I mean, a lot of the ones in my yard are probably about this size. So it's just yeah. like, it's kind of big for gravel, for sure. Yep. <laughs> well, closer to Rocky Butte, they get larger. And then when you get out uh, to the Willamette River, it's sand and silt. It was all the same deposit. That's the longest one. It actually probably went all the way across to the Tualatin Mountains at first. And then when the water flushed out, it cut where the river is now. Why is there, what's the hand? Rick, I have a question. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> good uh, to see you. Yes, good to be here again. Uh, was this a single event or were there several floodings over a period of time? There were several. Um, I talk about the largest one, which is probably the first one. Uh, and then from then on, the, the ice could never build up as much and uh, it, it would flush out sooner. So, so uh, the first one was the largest. Now, J. Harlan Bretz that first discovered them thought there was just one. And uh, he called it the Spokane flood because it came through Spokane. Well, towards the end of his life, he was convinced that maybe there were about five or so. And then since then, they've found various deposits that they interpret to mean up to 40 or in some places up to maybe 100 or more uh, various floods of different sizes. Now, also, I should clarify that not all of the floods across eastern Washington and down the Columbia River came from Lake Missoula. Of course, uh, you've heard of, of the Bonneville flood, uh, which came down the Columbia and uh, helped form uh, Hell's Canyon. But also, we had Lake Columbia, which was in the center of northern, northeastern Washington, and uh, it was actually flushed out when the Missoula flood came through, but then also Lake Chelan and some of the others were uh, glacial lakes formed at about the same time. So we did have floods from various places, uh, but they, that's why we say the Ice Age floods, not the Ice Age flood. Well, about how many years did this all take place? Well, the, it, it has changed since I've been studying it, but what they now say is that the last one was about 15,000 years ago, and the first one was more like 18 or even earlier, uh, 1,000 years ago. So um, the, 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 what the, the most recent uh, consensus um, is it was between 15 and 18,000 years ago. And then depending on how many floods you want to talk about, they, it, it determines how, how much time was in between. So uh, there's one geologist that says there was only 12 years in between, but I have a hard time believing that that much water and ice could build up in 12 years. So uh, others say it was more like 100 or, or so. Rick, I have a question. When you first, um, the first thing you showed us was, one of the first things was dry falls. And you said that um, uh, over a period of two weeks, the water came across. And that, uh, I'm following up kind of on his question because um, I, I did, did you mean to imply that it the water came there only once? No, in, in the largest of the floods, it was, it lasted about two weeks. So now there's, there's people who are actually trying to trace the different elevations of the coolies to determine what order they were in. And actually before anything came over Dry Falls, uh, Moses Cooley was carved first. And then the, the ice that eventually created Grand Cooley covered the end of Moses Cooley, the upper end, and forced the entire flood and then and the Columbia River for a time to go down uh, over Dry Falls. So uh, I don't know if I did I answer your question. <laughs> um, 
Okay. <laughs> Is it possible? Is it possible to get the programs from the different chapters? Are they all located in one place, or do you have to go to the chapter to get them? Or on the on the internet? They are on the internet at the uh, Ice Age Floods Institute bookstore. Now. Uh, have we seen a, a, an actual finished collection of that, Sylvia? Uh, no, not not yet. We haven't physically seen it, but they have all 11 chapters are done and they have it in what they call a brick. So you would get a packet of all uh, each individual of the 11 chapters and then it will have a Ice Age Floods Institute brochure also, and then also a descriptive page on the back of it showing you what you get in the packet. So they sell that as a packet. If you wanted just the Lower Columbia chapter brochure, we would need to be at a meeting physically together because uh, mailing them out just gets to be prohibitive unless you wanted to order a whole bunch. But if you wanted to order just one or two, uh, it, it, it gets- Once we're meeting again, you can come get them. Yeah. What was the volume of the largest flood? About 540 cubic miles of water. Now that's about half the size of one of the largest Great Lakes or like uh, two times Erie or two times Ontario. So, and those are very deep lakes, as you know. So, so it was a, a very large amount of water and the lake itself emptied in two to four days. So it was, you know, unimaginable that that much uh, water would be roaring across Eastern Washington and down the Columbia River Gorge in such a short amount of time. I like your illustration of how much water that is, that it would stretch from Portland. Tell them that one. Now what, 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 uh, because see, I've been doing this for 25 years or so. I've been trying to figure a way to imagine that much water. So the best one I came up with was if you had a bathtub that was one mile wide and one mile deep, it would stretch from Portland to San Francisco. <laughs> now, I tried that one time to find out what that would weigh, because you can imagine the the earthquakes and and the 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 shaking of the ground it would have caused as it flowed, but uh, the number was was beyond me. So it's a massive amount of weight. Oh yeah. I pictured uh, it sort of like the moon rolling across eastern Washington, but I don't. I think the moon's too big. Hi, <laughs> uh, uh, go ahead. Rob Castleberry here. I'm a new member and ah. first time to a meeting, and uh, thank you so much. It's been very interesting. Well, and uh, my biggest takeaway is uh, you know what you describe about that uh, seventy percent. Uh, uh, sand and gravel and rock and 30% water. And so when you talk about the water flowing uh, across uh, central Washington, boy, I got a whole different picture now. And 400 feet of water over Portland, whoa, that is some heavy uh, uh, gunky uh, stuff. So yep. one question that I have is, is that sloshes up the Willamette Valley and uh, um, I'm here in Eugene. Uh, there was probably a whole lot less that uh, uh, went back out, so you got a whole lot smaller flow. Is that right? That uh, one one geologist I've talked to says that only about 20% of it actually stayed, but okay. there's places in the Willamette Valley where there is uh, 1,200 feet of Missoula flood sediments. 
I don't know exactly how that could be, other than the weight of it causes it to sink, especially in in a swampy type area. The the weight of the material being brought in actually will cause the ground to sink, as the ice did. Uh, as the ice built up over Canada, it actually uh, pushed the the uh, surface of the land down, and then when the ice melted, the land went back up and they say it is still moving up very gradually now. So I think that's probably the only excuse how we could get 1200 feet of uh, sediments in the Willamette Valley from these floods. But that's what they say. Um, I think, I think they said something like, oh boy, no, I, I don't remember what the volume of the the sediment coming into the Willamette Valley was, but you can imagine it, it was a lot. And the reason the Willamette Valley is, is fairly flat is because of all that sediment that was brought in. Yeah, I have a friend in Washington that wants to get a, a shirt that says, Oregon stole our dirt. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, they gave it to us. <laughs> <laughs> My thought is, if, if Oregon can get the Willamette meteorite back, then we can consider giving some of the soil back. <laughs> and the, the Natural History Museum has said no. <laughs> In fact, the courts have said no. It, it has gone all the way to the Supreme Court, but uh, it's it's not. It, that's why we have to have a replica. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you so much. Sure appreciate it. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Now, next month we will again have a Zoom meeting and we will have Vic Baker. He is Regents Professor at University of Arizona. And he is just one of the, uh, but what do I say? If, if you were to ask, who knows the most about the Lake Missoula floods and such, Vic Baker's name would come up every time. So, uh, we look forward to that July 16th, and I will be sending out an e-blast on that. So thank you again so much for joining us. Good night.